Bhagavato Sama Sambuddhasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the full enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. No, you know, I was lost in a book. I just, yeah, I'm so glad you called me, you know, because I was lost in a book. I was trying desperately to read. This is a famous thing for me. I want you to know this. Uh, I, it's like uh, uh, finding something and then not putting it on a card or not bookmarking it within 24 hours, needing it and not being able to go back and find it. And it's the most frustrating thing because it was a statement that uh, Sariputta made where at the end of this little short thing, it's, I don't know how to find it. It's about Nibbana. It's in the Samyutta Nikaya. And um, the last part of this short sutta, it's the one person asks him, so does it take a long time to reach Nibbana was the question. And Sariputta says, not long friend not long and i just got so excited about somebody just saying not long not long and you know the more i go through the investigation i've been working all day on the anatta book and the more i work on this um the more i see no this isn't it isn't a difficult thing and we've turned it into this huge complicated thing over time and the misunderstanding has it, they've even turned it into there's Nibbana and there's only one and that's it, folks. And then with that also came the I had a discussion with three monks yesterday about um, with that statement. Also, what comes in right after that is that a Sotapanna, um, some of the requirements for Sotapanna have just gotten out of hand, totally out of hand. And when we look at the actual interpretation of Sotapanna, it means um, enlightenment uh, by one that has heard, you see? And so this was, but hearing what? It was hearing uh, the Buddhist suttas, but it was hearing the actual words of the Buddha, the suttas themselves. It wasn't somebody saying, well, I'm going to talk about this sutta tonight and just talking about it without actually allowing you to hear the words of the Buddha, the way they were taught originally to the monks. And then we tend to say, well, every nobody is strong. This is interesting. Nobody is strong enough today, uh, making the assumption no one is strong enough today uh, that they would actually do what we do with these suttas in these books by uh, taking away the ditto marks and reading them through with all of the repetition. But when we do that for people, they're discovering the Buddha was within his training method. He had a system of repetition for training based on the six sense doors. And that the way that you taught the mind was through, we know through neurocognitive science that the way you teach the mind or the brain something new is by doing it the same way over and over again. And by taking, saying the world in Buddhism goes from your head to you, the soles of your feet, okay? Uh, so you are, you are practicing constantly, persistently within the boundaries of your head to your feet in what he's trying to explain to you. And so he wants you to, to do it and he wants you to memorize parts of it, not big long suttas that are very difficult to memorize, but there are many, many suttas that are, were the suttas like the drills. It would be fun, Dhamma Gavesi, to, it would be fun to um, pull out, um, you know, try to go through and find all the suttas that actually you think that's a drill, that was a drill that they practiced, you see? And that would be the suttas that have sections in it repetitiously for the six sense doors to be exercised for one particular reason for you to learn one particular point really completely into your mind. And so the best, a good example of it, of course, is, is the uh, Chichaka Sutta, but all, there's lots of places in there where this is. And, the, and then see, I, what I was playing with tonight, you, you should give me your opinion about this, 
is, you know, um, and I'm going to check this one. Newton wasn't here, so I couldn't check with her, but she's going, she's working on her thesis for her master's in philosophy now and archaeology, Buddhist archaeology and everything. And so she's really tied up. But this this is the thing that uh, actually uh, Delson and I, Delson Armstrong and I had a little discussion about this. Uh, using the term revulsion or disenchantment. And in, in the, uh, in the Majima Nikaya, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi tended to go through and speak about what happens in the development, for instance, of the Upanisha Sutta going through to the point of disenchantment about things, which is the point where you want to, you want to practice a lot more at that point, a lot more because you're not interested in going out so much to other things and getting involved with the uh, con conventional reality. You want to stick with the ultimate reality and see what it really is. So you dis become disenchanted with things and you work a little bit harder at that point. Then the next level comes out as dispassion. And I think that's reasonable. And, and Delson and Armstrong thought this is this is reasonable. I thought that was reasonable too. And I just, what happens to me when I look at the word and I just looked it up, uh, I looked it up and sat them beside each other. And I said, you know, revulsion, that's not what's going on here. So how is it that we adopted this word revulsion in some translations instead of dispassion? I'm curious, you see. And if we if we look at everything across the board, which we have to look at everything that would influence people deciding to use uh, revulsion instead of um, this instead of dispassion, and um, what happens is that you you see where um, everything jeez um, everything jeez uh, that was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just went out. Let's see if it come back. We say dispassion and revulsion. Okay, we go to Vasudhimaga, and if we look at Vasudhimaga and the heavy emphasis that was there on the treatment of the hindrances, that's what we have to look at. So if you're adopting something, if you do not teach, if you do not know about the actual way of uh, the operation of a hindrance. If you have not discovered what we've tried to show you in, in um, page uh, 1597 or so of the Samyutta Nikaya is the discussion in the Bojanga Samyutta of exactly, precisely what feeds a hindrance, what is the nutriment for it, what makes it come back, what makes it keep operating and what stops it. It's right there. The total complete information is there, but don't believe it. I didn't believe it. Test it. And it works perfectly. So once you are shown the actual operation of a hindrance, then you should let go of destroy, annihilate, eradicate, subdue, suppress, press down, all this stuff about a hindrance and personally trying to make something stop when you should be dedicated entirely to embracing anatta and letting go of atta, the personal as taking everything personally and take, what would it be if you took everything impersonally and just applied what you knew about the hindrance, you see? But the moment you took that and you embraced the wrong interpretation for the management of a hindrance, then, Using the word revulsion sounds just fine, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Because this is fitting the harsh characterization that you have put on this. And we have, we have really, really, it's almost time for me to try to just lock myself up in a closet, <laughs> you know, and start writing nothing except those things that I have seen and collected for years that have changed in Buddhism from the beginning to now. Because if you look at all of those things and together you see, oh, wow, if that's what's happening, well, then, of course, we can't do this or that in this lifetime. Of course, we cannot reach Sotapanna. Of course, we cannot reach the other attainments. Of course, this, of course, that, because you have embraced a violent personal doing of something in the practice when the entire practice was based on you personally getting out of the way, 
moving away, not taking anything personally, trying to see what was essentially happening in the present time, for instance, letting go of the things that were from the past still floating into your head and leaving alone the things that were the future that were still out here bugging you, which I find hard to do with the crisis in the United States. But, <laughs> you know, I'm guilty of this too. Everybody's guilty of this. We're si I'm sitting outside the country, watching the country go down the tubes faster than people, I think, can catch it. I don't know if it'll be there if I decide to go home in four years. And Bonte has told me point blank, don't come back right now. <laughs> and I'm there, if I go back, will I get stuck and not be able to come back here? Yeah, this is, this is really icky right now. No questions about this. These people are trying to so divide the country and split up the groups and make more groups every week and separate people as hard as they possibly can. And it's just an absolute crazy thing. And nobody can see through that mesh to see what it's really all about. And I don't care. <laughs> I just want people to be happy and smile. So I come back down to earth and start, you know, working again. But this thing about revulsion in Buddhism, if we say revulsion, I, mean, I just want you to listen to what I'm saying, you know, because um, if you, what, does this sound appealing to you? If I tell you that all of all of, uh, just think carefully about this. If I say to you the real goal in Buddhism is to have total revulsion for the body, for revulsion for um, everything everybody's doing in the, in the uh, conventional reality, just revulsion toward the whole thing, toward everything. Makes me sound like if I did get enlightened and I was like that, I'd want to go in a cave and never come out. You know, why would I want to come out to do anything for anybody? And this is what people are going to interpret this as. And it's kind of, I want to have a talk with a few people about this word. But listen to, listen to the, um, re, where is it? Revulsion. Re, revulsion. Are you ready? Repulsion, disgust, nausea, distaste, aversion, repugnance, recoiling from it, whatever it is in front of you. Abhorrence loathing, hate, hatred, detestation, and contempt. Does that sound like Buddhism? Does it sound like it's going to make you happy? <laughs> Come on, let's go down. All right, so here, here's the next one. All right, now, this, this passion is actually in here, which I was glad it showed up because I don't use regular dictionaries. I always use the sources. I want a whole bunch of comparison words. So let's see, this passion, I found it in here. And dispassion, now this is reasonable. And for those of us who have had experiences who have gone through different levels with this whole thing at different times and different pieces of it, no matter where we are, this sounds familiar. This sounds, this sounds a little better, you know? Um, let's see, I got it right here. And I think it's the, it's the thing to really consider. This sounds like it, we're dispassionate unemotional, emotionless when we're confronted with things, unmoved, unexcited, unexcitable, unflappable, unperturbed, nonchalant. Well, that one I don't agree with, but that's kind of a neutral feeling. But we are unruffled, cool, collected, cool and collected, calm, composed, self Possessed, nah, 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 nah. okay, level headed, self controlled, temperate, sober, placid, equable, tranquil, serene, uh, and together as a person. We are not judgmental, we're more detached and impartial and objective and disinterested in what is unessential, for instance. Um, Neutral, we're fair, adjust, just, equitable, even-handed, square dealing, open-minded. Now, which one of those words would you say you wanted for the end result of Buddhism? And I cannot believe thousands of people would have followed someone who was saying what you need to do is turn around and be disgusted with everything. I'm sorry, it doesn't work. And it isn't coming out that when we practice, and we move down the path that that's what's happening to hundreds and hundreds of people, if not thousands by now. I don't really keep 
can I, I thought about that the other day. I don't know if I can say, <laughs> I say thousands now because I, I'm pretty sure he went over thousand. <laughs> I know that in the, in the last 15 years, I know we went into the thousands. I just don't know when it happened because I never have them in one place. Yeah, I wasn't the organized that way. So let's just dive into this. We can talk about this at the end a little bit. We can throw back to this topic if you want, but let's go through this. We're going to talk about the Buddha and his relatives, and we're going to start with Nanda, which is one of the sad stories. It's, it always, I like this story though. On the third day after the arrival of the Buddha, when he came back to Kapalavatu, Prince Nanda, the son of Queen Mayam Pajapati Godami, was celebrating his consecration ceremony. That's his marriage ceremony and the housewarming ceremony. And it was on the occasion of these three festivals when congratulations were being offered to the prince that the Buddha visited the palace. And after the meal, the Buddha handed the bowl to the prince and uttering a blessing, he rose to go without taking his bowl with him. So the Buddha's handed his bowl to his cousin, to his um, a, a cousin, uh, I think it's a cousin or is it a half brother? I'm not sure. Um, is, is what is it? It's cousin? cousin, I think so. Cousin. It's cousin, okay. He's handed him the bowl and now he gets up and he walks away without the bowl. So the prince followed him, thinking that the Buddha would take the bowl from him at any moment. But the Buddha would not take it, and the prince, out of reverence for him, continued to follow the teacher. He was carrying the bowl. Janapada Kalyana, to whom he was betrothed, hearing that the prince was following the Buddha with a bowl in his in hand, with tears streaming down her cheeks and her hair half combed, ran after the prince Nanda as fast as she could and said to him, return quickly, O Lord, please, O noble Lord. These affectionate words penetrated his heart and he was deeply moved. But with deference to the Buddha, he could not possibly return the bull to him. So he accompanied the Buddha to the park, his temporary residence. And on arrival at the park, there, the Buddha questioned Nanda whether he would become a monk. So great was his reverence for him as the Buddha and as an elder brother of his that with reluctance, he agreed to be admitted to the order. So it was his half brother. I guess it was his half. I was wrong, huh? yes. Yeah, I guess so. So he's now admitted into the order right after his marriage. All right, but Nanda... Bhikkhu enjoyed no spiritual happiness resulting from renunciation. He was greatly depressed and was constantly thinking of his bride. He related his mental troubles to the bhikkhus, thus saying, brethren, I am dissatisfied. I am now living the religious life, but I cannot endure to lead the holy life any longer. I intend to abandon the higher precepts and return to the lower life, the life of a layman. And hearing this, the Buddha questioned Venerable Nanda whether such a report was true. He admitted his weakness and stated that he was worried about his bride. Now the Buddha devised a means to set him on the right path with the object of showing him celestial nymphs, the Buddha, using his psychic powers, took him to the Tawa Timsa heaven. On the way, the venerable Nanda was shown a singed she monkey who had lost her ears, nose and tail in a fire, clinging to a burnt up stump in a scorched field. Reaching heaven, the Buddha pointed to him celestial monks and asked him, Nanda, which do you regard as being more beautiful and fair to look upon and handsome, your noble wife, Janapada Kalyana, or a celestial nymph? 
Venerable Sir Janapada Kalama is like the singed monkey when compared to those celestial nymphs who are infinitely more beautiful and fair. Cheer up, Nanda. I guarantee that you will possess them if you persevere as I bid. And in that case, I, I shall take the greatest pleasure in living the holy life, said Venerable Ananda childishly. So hearing that Venerable Ananda was living the holy life with the object of winning celestial nymphs, the bhikkhus ridiculed him, calling him a jeerling. Eventually, he became ashamed of his base motive and striving diligently, he did attain arahatship. He thereupon approached the Buddha and said, Venerable Sir, I release the exalted one from the promise that he made when he guaranteed that I should win celestial nymphs. The Buddha replied, when Nanda, you ceased to cling to the things in the world and your heart was released from the corruptions, at that moment, I was released from that promise. Do not fear. He then uttered the following paean of joy. He that has crossed over the mud and crushed the thorn of lust. He that has destroyed delusion. Such a man is unmoved, whether in pleasure or in pain. And when some monks doubted his attainment of arahatship, the Buddha in explanation uttered the following stanzas. Even as rain penetrates an ill-thatched hutch, so does lust penetrate an undeveloped mind. Even as rain does not penetrate a well-thatched house, so does lust not penetrate a well-developed mind. Enjoying the bliss of emancipation, he praised the teacher and saying, oh, excellent is the method of the master, whereby I was drawn out of the mire of rebirth and set on Nibbana's strand. The Teragata attributes the following verses to him, the Teragata are the verses that were said by the Arahats when they became and awakened. Through not reflecting rightly, I was attached to outward show. And overcome by passionate love, I was restless and I was fickle. Because of the skillful means devised by the Buddha, the kinsman of the sun, Rightly, I acted and drew out my mind from existence. Venerable Nandatera was placed chief among the disciples in respect of self-control. So that was his legacy. The Buddha and Ananda. Now, Ananda was a cousin of Prince Siddhartha. And he was the son of Amitadana, a younger brother of King Suhodana. As he was born bringing happiness to all his kinsfolk, he was named Ananda. In the second year of the Buddha's ministry, Ananda entered the order together with the Sakya nobles. Anuruddha, Badia, Bagu, Kimbala, and Devadatta. Not long after hearing a sermon from the venerable Puna Mantaniputta, he attained the first stage of sainthood, Sotapanna. When the Buddha was 55 years old, Venerable Ananda became his chief attendant. During the first 20 years after his enlightenment, the Buddha had no permanent attendant. The few temporary attendants were not dutiful and their behavior was not highly commendable. 
One day while residing at Jetwana, the Buddha addressed the bhikkhus and said, now I am old bhikkhus. When I say, let us go this way, some go another way. Some drop my bowl and robe on the ground. Choose out one disciple to attend always upon me. And forthwith all the bhikkhus from Venerable Sariputta downwards volunteered their services. But the Buddha declined their kind offer. As the Venerable Ananda was silent, he was advised by the bhikkhus to offer his services. He consented on condition that the Buddha would grant the following eight boons. Wait one moment, I have to get the door. <laughs> We look at the uh, Buddha. We, he, he, uh, Ananda was uh, considered for the position and uh, he said he would consent on condition that the Buddha would grant the following eight boons. And this is special because it tells us why he was so important in the end as far as the first conference and everything. So listen carefully. The Buddha first should not give him robes when he him, which he himself has received. So if a gift was made to the Buddha, um, the Buddha should not ever give him a gift that was given to him. And number two, the Buddha should not give him food which he has received. He did not want that to happen. The third one, the Buddha should not allow him to dwell in the same fragrant chamber. This is a place where the Buddha used to meditate and um, he said he did not want to dwell in there uh, with him at the same time. Number four, the Buddha should not take him with him wherever the Buddha is invited. So sometimes um, he would be invited perhaps for a meal or something with someone he did not have to go with him every single time. The fifth one, the Buddha should kindly go with him wherever he is, I'm sorry, the Buddha should kindly, I think it means let him go with him wherever he is invited. That, that's mixed up, Bunty, I don't understand that. This is Ananda or Ananda? Yeah, this is Ananda, this is Ananda, yeah. okay. Now the first condition was the fourth condition was the Buddha should not take him with him wherever the Buddha is invited. This could be a mistake. I'm not sure. The fifth one says the Buddha should kindly go with him wherever he is invited. Oh, okay, I see it. Uh, so if Ananda is invited to go somewhere, the Buddha would agree to go with him. And then the the sixth one is. The Buddha should kindly give him permission to introduce visitors that come from afar to see the Buddha. So he acts as the liaison person in bring, as they come in to visit him. And the seventh one, the Buddha should kindly grant him permission to approach him whenever any doubt should arise. And this was because he was memorizing everything, I think. And number eight, the Buddha should kindly repeat to him the discourses that were declared in his absence. Now, some people have said to me, it's just not possible. Anand is a real person. Nobody could have done what he did. And then I go back to the years that my husband was in the military and we were in Taiwan and I met several people that were involved in the Vietnam War in the intelligence community. And yes, there are people who actually can sit down and or listen from behind a tree to six people having a conversation, you can record it and then ask the person what was said and they will say precisely every word that was recorded on the recording. And these people were in the military in intelligence services. And this, when I became a Buddhist, I'm thinking back, wow, that guy could have been recruited to work for the Buddha. <laughs> You know, because he, he, this is the kind of thing that they were doing. 
So this is actually a real potential thing that can happen for some people. It's an audiogenic memory and you re can remember absolutely everything that was said to you. The next, the Buddha granted these, uh, these four negative and four positive boons. Thenceforth, the Venerable Ananda acted as his favorite attendant for 25 years until the Buddha's last moment. Like a shadow, he followed him everywhere, attending to all his needs with great love and care. Both during day and night, his services were always at the disposal of his master. At night, it is stated that he used to go round the fragrant chamber nine times with staff and torch in hand to keep him awake and to prevent the Buddha's sleep from being disturbed. Now Ananda and the Bodhi tree. It was Venerable Ananda who was responsible for the planting of the Ananda Bodhi tree. In the absence of the Buddha, devout followers who used to bring flowers and garlands, lay them at the entrance of the fragrant chamber and depart with much rejoicing. Anapapindika came to hear of it and requested Venerable Ananda to inquire of the Buddha whether there was a possibility of finding a place where his devotees might pay obeisance to the Buddha when he was away on his preaching tours. And Venerable Ananda approached the Buddha and asked, Lord, how many objects of reverence are there? May it please you? There are three, Ananda. There are objects of reverence appertaining to the body, saririka, objects of reverence pertaining to personal use, Parivogika and objects of reverence reminiscent of the Buddha, Udasika. It is proper, Lord, is it proper to construct a chetia while you are alive? No, not an object of reverence appertaining to the body, which it is proper to erect after the passing away of the Buddha. An object of reverence reminiscent of the Buddha has no physical basis. It is purely mental. But the great Bodhi tree used by the Buddha, whether he is alive or dead, is an object of reverence, Chetia. Lord, when you go on your preaching journeys, the great monastery of Jedavana is without refuge and people find no place of reverence. Lord, may I bring a seed from the great Bodhi tree and plant it at the entrance to Jedavana. Very well, Ananda, you may plant it. It will then be as if I constantly abide there in Jedavana. Venerable Ananda mentioned this matter to the Buddha's principal lay attendants, Anathapindika, Vishaka, and King Kosala, and requested the Venerable Moggallana to secure a fruit from the great Bodhi tree. Readily he consented and obtained a fruit that was falling from the tree and delivered it to Venerable Ananda. This was presented to the king, who in turn handed it to Anathapindika. Then he stirred up the fragrant soil and dropped it in the hole that was dug. And the tree that sprang up in that place was known as the Ananda Bodhi tree. Next subject is Ananda and women. It was also Venerable Ananda who persuaded the Buddha to admit women 
into the order had it been not been for his intervention maha pajapati godami would not have succeeded in becoming a bhikkhuni nun bhikkhunis held him in high esteem his sermons were greatly appreciated by them on one occasion he approached the buddha and asked him how are we to conduct ourselves, Lord, with regard to womankind? Not seeing them, Ananda, but if we should see them, Lord, what are we to do? Do not talk to them, Ananda, <laughs> but if they should speak to us, Lord, what are we to do? Be watchful, Ananda. This general exhortation was given to bhikkhus so that they may constantly be watchful in their dealings with women. As he possessed a powerfully retentive memory, and as he had the rare privilege of listening to all the discourses of the Buddha, owing to his close association with him, he was later appointed the custodian of the Dhamma, the Dhamma Mandagarika, Referring to his own knowledge of the Dhamma, in reply to a question put forth to him by a Brahmin, Venerable Ananda said, 82,000 suttas from the Buddha and 2,000 from the bhikkhus I received. There exist 84,000 texts in all. The Buddha ranked him foremost among his disciples in five respects, erudition, retentive memory, good behavior, steadfastness, and the ministering of care. Though a distinguished disciple, well-versed in the Dhamma, he lived as a learner, Sekha, till the death of the Buddha. The Buddha's final exhortation to him was, you have done merit in the past, Ananda. Quickly be free from corruptions. It was only after the passing of the Buddha that he attained his arahatship as he was expected to take a leading part in the first council, which was composed only of arahants. He made a strenuous effort and attained his arahantship on the night preceding the convocation. While he was about to lie down on his couch, it is stated that he was the only disciple who attained arahatship free from the postures of sitting, standing, walking, or sleeping. He was in a position on a couch, sitting, and in the process of lying down when he went through, and then he went down. Venerable Ananda passed away at the age of 120 years old. The Dhammapada commentary states that as people of both the sides of the river Rohini were equally serviceable to him. And as both sides vied with each other to possess his relics, he sat cross-legged in the air over the middle of the river. He preached the Dhamma to the multitude and wished that his body would split in two and that one portion would fall on the near side, the other on the far side. He then entered into an ecstatic meditation on the element of fire. Instantly, flames of fire issued from his body, and as willed, one portion of his body fell on the near side, and on the other, it fell on the far side. The Teragata gives several stanzas uttering by him on various occasions, the following verses, which deal with the frailty of this so-called beautiful body are 
particularly interesting. Behold this adorned body, a mass of sores, a lump infirm, much thought of, whereof nothing lasts and nothing persists. The Buddha and Mahapajapati is the next topic. I'm wondering, should we stop here and do questions? Bhante, what do you think? Yes, we can uh, stand the questions. And we could take Mahapajapati next yeah. time because this is quite long. OK, it's a longer section. And then we can go into Devadatta next time. So let's throw open the floor. Do you have any questions? By the way, I have sent, I found the, uh, I found the uh, uh, quotation you were looking for. I have, uh, <laughs> sent you on the WhatsApp and I have shared it over here also. Oh, yeah, yes. I found that quotation. That's great. The last That's is what friend, if a bhikkhu is practicing in accordance with Dhamma, would it take him long to become a arahan? Not long friend. Not yes, long uh, friend. Not long. And the key to that whole thing revolves around this little box with all the instructions in it. If you understand them correctly, you follow them succinctly, exactly as they are. This stuff works. I can only tell you this stuff really works. And, um, you know, but we have gone so far away from that idea, so far. And part of it, it has to do with just the natural desire to change it, make it mine more like that. You see, that's why coming from Bhante, but the, he doesn't do that. <laughs> you can go back and listen to him teach a sutta. I encourage you to try this sometime if you want to know if he's a consistent teacher. You go to the website, damasuka.org, go to the library, then when you get in the library, click on the, um, the map for the um, Majima Nikaya, go in there and you know pick a sutta and get into the system where there all the suttas are listed by number and find a sutta that has uh, you know, been presented like 10 times or 15 times. And then go back to 2004 and listen, 2005, and then come up to 2010, and then go to 2015, and then go to 2020. And you're going to get a shock. Nobody can believe he's that consistent in the way that he's presenting something. But what's happening is we are taught how to rely on the Four Noble Truths and rely on the Eightfold Path as their guidance system to try to be consistent in the way that we're teaching. And we'll tell someone straight up when they want to be a teacher in the very front of everything, the most difficult thing for you to teach is going to be saying the same thing, uh, you know, 500 times. Like we, we told one student something, I think I, I witnessed it at least a hundred times with him. And then one day he went to Bhante's door and he knocked on the door, you know, just knocking on the door and Bhante comes to the door and he says through the screen door, what's up? And he says, wow, I just discovered something. <laughs> he recites something that he just discovered and he's just amazed at this. And this is something that we had listened to Bhante try to point out hundreds and hundreds of times, you know, and all of a sudden, here it goes. The fact is that you need to keep listening to the suttas numbers of times, because as you develop, you hear even after years of practice and your development is happening, you, you're advancing. And when you listen to the same sutta, you're going to hear more and more things. That's what was happening here. Okay, so let's open up to questions. Anyone have questions about these characters? Any of them? Wow, that's a shock. <laughs> you guys, come on, you must have questions about these. Any questions? Wow. Don't know. Let's see. 
Um, <laughs> Sarah, you, Sarah, okay. Hi, I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm lying down because my back, is, I've pulled my back. Ouch. But anyway, that's for, to explain my strange posture. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about the, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, the women. Uh -huh. um, I find it, um, yeah, some of the things are said about the need to be very watchful in the company of women. And mm. it's almost like there's something wrong with being a woman. Um, no, there's not something like, wrong with being a woman. I'd like to explain a bit about why, yeah. why there has to be such care taken around us, because my understanding of the path and, and everything you've described is as the development happens, then things are going to just relax out and lust would disappear. So I don't understand why, and unless it's to guidance for when you're more rooted in your body. And so that's still more of an issue to, to be guarding your sense doors. Okay. <laughs> First of all, in Southeast Asia, men are a bit more heated and compassionate towards this whole thing. That's, the, that's one of the things that's different, okay? And I think the other thing is not everybody's an arahat. What you're saying is about dispassion is in the last level of becoming, moving to into arahatship. You, you, you learn this in order to go through with Nibbana, you do taste that, but you don't get to keep it until you're an arahat. So we're just talking about pheromones. <laughs> don't go in the vicinity of pheromones if you're someone who's lustful. And the thing was the biggest danger for the construction of the uh, monkhood with the Buddha leading it and the whole setup with any of these setups at that time was the protection from the lay people. They would not support them if they were breaking precepts or if they were in trouble somehow. You see, so when you when I took a course, I was very lucky to take a course with a very old nun, um, and she was in Sri Lanka at um, at Siba, the Sri Lankan um, right Sri Lankan Institute for Buddhist uh, uh, studies and everything in Palakali, and when she gave the course on the Vinaya, the rules. We, I only got through half the course. I really wished I could have gone through the whole thing. She told every single story that led up to every single rule that was created. If you can imagine, there's 300 and some odd rules. Told every single story to how every single rule came in. So this has all been documented and, and well kept. And almost all those rules that are controlling of or warning monks or this or that or the other of uh, the nature of, of um, the downfall of a monk, you know, are protecting them from like, you're not allowed to walk out of the monastery at night. Why? Because one of the monks went out and he fell into a, um, oh, it was a septic pool. It wasn't like manure. It was where the people were going to the, he fell in and had to come back to the monastery. And then this thing about shoes, everything is documented like that. And this isn't any you know, feminist issue or women's rights issue or anything like that compared to today at all. You can't even go there with this, okay? Um, back then it was just, you cannot be seen sitting with a woman. You cannot be sitting alone in a room with a woman. You cannot be working in a, even today in a print shop in a temple without another monk there or another woman there. You cannot be there like that because as soon as you are, the other thing that's just rampant in my opinion, really rampant in Asia is gossip in, in Sri Lanka and Singapore and different places. I, I see, I maybe it's just that I've been exposed to the gossip here more than I was exposed to the gossip at home. I'm sure there's a lot of gossip at home, but here it's just, that's a, a preoccupation of a lot of people is just to gossip, gossip and gossip just goes around and turns into slander and starts turning into bad situations, really bad situations. And um, that's it, you know, all those rules were done to protect the, the monk from that. The warning to the young monks coming in, I mean, you have young monks, think about it a minute, you have young monks coming in 
from, they can come in at eight years and older with permission of parents, okay? But they, um, they cannot go into their higher ordination until they're 18 years old. But, you know, think about the teenage years in the early 20s. Don't think of these as a bunch of middle-aged or older monks, okay? And the monks are dedicated to the development, to their development. But where are they in their development, see? Not everybody became arahants. Not everybody became anagamis, you know? And, um, and people who are sotapanna and sakatagami are just as susceptible, really, not as susceptible, but um, still susceptible a lot to things that are going, being drawn away, pulled away this way and that way. And you don't think about it, do you? If you get start having uh, thinking about something and then you start sitting down with somebody and talk, you don't think about something and you have to be careful, you see? This is what it's all about. It was about literally the safety of the Sangha, honestly. And uh, when you hear all those rules, you just, who was the, who was the person? Wasn't it Upali Bhante? Is that the, uh, the one? Upali was the one who went every, through everything and appears in the Vinaya so much. Upali had this happen, Upali had that happen. The adventures of yeah, Upali. A lot of stories are, uh, for many of the stories, uh, one character is there. Uh, yeah. For Vinaya. So they, they are in a book also. I think so. Uh, monks do have yeah. those books. Uh, I, I can't remember books. exactly. I don't remember what book we were using at that time. I think we just had the copy of the of the rules themselves and we were going through them one by one and then she was supplying. It was a, a two volume uh, book on uh, Vinaya. It is in uh, English. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, where uh, the origin story is also there and uh, the rules are there and then the, there are sub rules and the later yeah. rules are there and then commentaries everything is there so that could be that's the kind of thing like if you want to understand it better you try to get something like that the two two volume one try to get that i think it's in paperback if i'm not mistaken it's in paperback and you start to begin to get a more of a feel for what this is about but it's like you saying, well, men in London are not the same as men in South America. And don't for one minute think they are. In South America, they're all hot-blooded. And hot-blooded means they're very passionate right in the, in, the drug, in the drug store, in the grocery store with you and coming you know, up to you and assuming and just making looking like they want to make a pass at you and things like that. So this is the people are different all over the world in this in this way this is not the libido is different with the temperature i think part of that i'm not sure perel might be able to comment on that i'm not sure but i think the temperature of a country the tropics have a big difference from the mid the middle you know latitudes and the north definitely a difference you know and look you're talking about this is the other thing you are talking about a country that grew up understanding about the, um, what's it called? <laughs> the uh, Kama Sutra comes from India. They were, they were, it's in all the temples. It's on all the temples and all over the place, all around you all the time. Everything is there. It's an open book. Not in all the temples. There are a certain, a certain uh, location uh, where the, the, the yeah. temple is. Yeah. I doubt you can go to a city in India, though, where there isn't something that is putting this, you know, in, in a lot. But at the same time, like in America, in the movies, are have gone out of control. <laughs> You know, but in India, uh, when you go look at Bollywood, you have this wonderful adventure of a relationship between men and women all the time, but you don't have a lot of blatant bare sexuality going on. It's true, right? I don't know if you watch Bollywood, but you should make a point of watching some Bollywood movies because they're really delightful. And even if you're, this is funny because they have a, they have a, a recipe for Bollywood movies. Does anybody know what it is? I can't remember. Bunty, do you remember what it is? There's a recipe for it. And every movie is required to have this in it and this in it and this in it, every movie. And so one time I was invited to go and, and see um, a, a spy movie where there were these relationships we were talking about and they invited me to go and I went to see it. I hadn't seen one before. And, um, and the thing about it was, that 
this is a spy movie and it was very serious this movie and like it was like a James Bond movie and in the middle of it they had to put the dancing sequel in there and all the people are dancing and there was another film that was about the the breaking apart of Pakistan into two two pieces and how families were broken apart this was a serious documentary almost a documentary film it was a good drama with good acting but the thing was it was a documentary on the uh, the terrible terrible situation of the separation of this country losing your family getting caught going this way and your other half going that way. And there was a program to reunite them and try to find them. And they were trying to find their relatives, sort of like after the Jewish Holocaust it happened in Germany, trying to find what's left of your family somewhere. And in the process of this very serious film, the, the film actually came to an end and nobody got up in the theater to left. I said, why isn't anybody leaving? They said, well, it's a Bollywood film. We have to wait a minute. And then they came, they came back with a 20 minute piece to put on the screen, which was the dancing at, with all the people that were involved in the film in the location where they took the film. And like, they're all back together again. So now we're gonna have all the Bollywood dancing. They could not allow the film to go through as a serious film like that, like you would have the biography of General Patton or you would have the, the Churchill the story of Churchill. And then at the end of that, you would make sure you had the dancing sequel. It was kind of funny to me, uh, people really waited for that. They didn't want to leave. They had to see that piece of going to a movie here. But my point about the Bollywood films is there's lots of relationships and romance in it but there's not a lot of people going naked and lying in bed and having sex and all that stuff. It doesn't exist. So there's a big difference in what you're going to submit uh, for your public to watch, to be exposed to at all ages, you know? There's a lot of differences here. And so back then, now we have to go backwards and look at some of the things having to do with everything. Um, but back then, there was quite a lot more involved with the cat. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> there was great uh, differences involved. I have a question. Yeah, Mataji. Sarma, go ahead. You spoke about uh, the temples and figures and other things. I want uh, some more uh, explanation from Dhammagaveshi Bhante. Mm -hmm. Let okay. him explain the, the way wa he, what he wants to say. I want to learn from him. What about? Regarding the temple uh, images, there is only one uh, place in India where uh, temple uh, have kind of explicit images and everything. Ah. Uh, so, so that is uh, what, uh, it is not a general uh, kind of theme. Uh, uh, so this is uh, something where uh, it, it happened in a certain up period of time and it is in a certain location. And uh, that is uh, where uh, those kind of temples, and it, is a, it was a very brief amount of time that those temples were there. But what okay. is that archaeologists yeah. and everything rediscovered it, and uh, so it kind of became more kind of associated with, uh, because in, in the West, the images and everything goes, this is temple, so it kind of generalizes it. Says, okay, I don't, I don't want to generalize. I think that's very proper what you're saying. But let's look at also, for instance, over, for instance. Mataji, I would like to tell you this way, but yeah. Bante, Bante wanted to speak. Uh, during uh, this king's period, some king's period, after Buddha, uh, 300 years or 400 years after, yeah. one sage came, his name is Vatsayana. He wrote a book on this. And they, he believed that this particular uh, realization can be met, can be with the tantric practices, it can be achieved through that particular uh, way of images, what you have seen. Of course. Such, such, such images were, such, uh, such images were brought into some of the temples for a certain period of time. Yeah. And he was still a bachelor and he wrote a book on that particular uh, aspect, what he quoted, uh, the images of the temples. Yeah. But always, always, all temples will not bear the same images. No, 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 the, don't bear the same images. Uh, this is I what did, I actually what he wants to convey. A particular period of time 
like darshanas how they wrote the darshana means philosophy six philosophies are identified in uh, hindu uh, epistemology by hindu epistemology and such that along with such darshanas this sage also came his name was vasayana and he wrote a book on that particular thing and in his time all such temples were having the such images so the famous good old uh, temples also will have such images uh, these things happened during his time only it's a certain period of time yes okay. but then also see we have the influence of the tantric and i don't know the tantric comes into part of any the tantric comes in the north and goes into rajneesh is the example if you have seen in nagpur pune and others still his uh, ashrams are there still they are doing the tantric practices along with the ladies yeah that is one of the uh, ways of achieving uh, this particular realization is there rajneesh is famous and he was killed in america yeah i know uh, he purchased on an island he was there and finally he was killed so such people were there in india because different practices were there earlier so latest example is rajneesh uh, only because of tantric practices with the ladies and all of this is an effort to reach a clear mind for a small period of time this is what i want to emphasize yes so in in that sort in this sort of direction but the influence was there where you don't find the influence in other parts of the world sarah is what i'm trying to show you you know because because you this is that. the this is the karma land and this is the ancient uh, history is available only in india yeah yeah exactly uh, something bande wanted to speak ha so uh, what i wanted to say regarding this subject is that it also depends on the uh, time frame of the buddha so buddha had 10 reasons for giving uh, 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 his uh, vinaya rules it is not just one reason uh one of the reason is that he has to have a social uh, discord uh, not a, it should be in line with the social norms so that is also one of the reasons where he uh, gives a, a vinaya rule there are 10 reasons there is a list of reasons where uh, right, yeah. which is given also bikini so, bikinis were not allowed in the ashrams for more time yeah yeah so those are also a kind of a cultural context in which the buddha was staying so it is not a kind of a uh, any kind of a commentary on uh, any uh, at the time the, such a situation was there where uh, uh, at, uh, whatever sister kema said is correct those are also kind of relevant in that yes. but an, an uh, additional point is that the culturally also this were relevant kind of rules so uh, the rules were not only based on a single point but they were given 10 different aspects were uh, considered for putting a vinaya rule so that is <laughs> thank you thank you we should thank we you, should do, you know we should do that some day we should take the 10 reasons for the creation of the vinaya i'd be interested in that we should do that bunty you know um i think it would be interesting it would be interesting to talk about that yeah so you had to be protective of these uh, of the young monks and that's one of the reasons for it he's just saying you have to watch out for the guile of women and you know i'll say something here it's kind of interesting i was fascinated with the women's liberation movement in america but i was married with children and one of the things that happened for the women who were married with children is they left us out they didn't give us credit for the standing of a mother and staying at home and raising our children they didn't give us any respect many years later in the 1990s they apologized national organization for women apologized publicly and nationally for what had been done it was very agonizing for a lot of us and then later on when i set up my business was in human resources and placement of people and everything like that and was involved in that business um i had to deal with women's issues and from the feminist they would say well aren't you a, a, a you feminist when i would come with a court case fighting for a woman they would say are you a feminist i'll say here's how i'm a feminist and the original feminist definition was a fight 
for equal wages, for equal work and equal conditions and supplies for the job we're going to do that any man would have for the same job. That's what was all about in the very beginning. Now it is completely off the charts, completely unreasonable and completely over the cliff. You know, now it's a, a feminist can be such an extreme, but you can still find people that from my age group, you can still find people who were working with it in the beginning. But the, the feminist rights, you know, like I have uh, written a paper, but I never published it about the eight rules that were given by the Buddha to the women. And I didn't have much objection except to maybe one a little bit, but they came off the ceiling about these rules. And it got me thinking, why did they come off the ceiling about these rules and get so upset? Because it's it's crazy that the, 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 the label feminist has a bad rap right now because of what's been done with it to the extremes it's gone to push 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 there are women who think that you know because we have uh the bakunis want to come what what is the what is the sense of coming back as to become a bakuni and then when you sit down with a monk the first thing you say to that monk before you discuss the dhamma with him excuse me but let me please ask you uh sir before we begin what is your position on gender equality <laughs> Now, that monk, I was told what he would do, and um, I tried it once with a big monk just to see what would happen, and it did exactly happen, exactly as Bhante told me it would happen. The monk straightened his robes, and he quietly got up, and I had an appointment for this too, and he straightened his robes, and he for said, please forgive me, uh, I forgot I need to do something, and we can make an appointment another time, of course, which he never did. After this happened, I became clear to me they're handling this the wrong way. You see, gender equality would come forth within the Buddhist system if we didn't throw it in people's faces. We don't need to be doing that. If we, sit, if we were coming into Dhamma to help Dhamma and work side by side with monks and work with Dhamma for Dhamma for the good of the people, and that's all we were doing, then everything would be equal and it would work out. It might take a hundred years, which these people don't want to wait for. They want to crash the men's club, tear it apart and say women are equal inside. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. And why would you touch something? This is my other objection. Why would you touch something that it survived for 2,500 years, you know, and it, it isn't totally broken? It is broken in some ways uh, because, well, it's broken because they're not teaching, you know, they're not all clear about the Dhamma anymore and teaching the Dhamma to the people. And there's too much judgment coming from the monastic community overall who decides what you or I can understand or will never be able to understand. And that's sad. And that's why many things have disappeared. You know, dependent origination disappeared, went away. No one would talk about it. Well, I've got news. If you don't have seven links of the dependent origination, you're not going to understand what the whole program the Buddha gave you was for. You have to have it from the sixth sense to it's actually eight links. If I'm the six sense doors to contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendency, birth of reaction for an untrained mind, you have to have that so that you can very clearly understand what's happening to you before you try to let go of craving. You have to understand what craving work, you have to have that, those links, you have to have what craving actually is and how to detect it. And you have to have a not to teaching correctly given. This thing about the Ananta teaching is a broken, breaks, breaks your heart, just breaks your heart. So extreme misunderstanding of it that gets circulated and no explanation of the old translations that were done by linguists, not meditators, linguists primarily, that said it means no self or self. And no explanation afterwards. Of course you're upset. Of course you're mixed up. Of course, you want to run out the door when I say I'm going to give you a not to teaching. But once you understand and look through all of the, the texts, the texts that are talking about this, what it was actually about, you find out I have to have some of that. I have to try that. 
because that's going to make everything lighter for me. And that's going to make me come to the understanding nothing's happening to me. Everything is happening from me making the decision, interpreting from here, what I decide intention wise, what I decide is happening. You decide what is happening in all situations in your life. Nothing actually ever happened to you. It happened from you. Now recount the story and look back at how this is working if you want to go back. But the big one is stay in the present time, move forward with this, and it can be a total magical thing to change your life. So when this was set up, it was set up in that time. And the, the question I would ask you, Sarah, is can you sit there or can I sit here and then talk about another time and take a subject from today? I'll give you a good example, the best one I can think of. Uh, what was the name of, Bunty, what was the name of the woman that had to go and find the mustard seed? I always forget. <laughs> <We had> to... <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, but... Gautami? Gautami. Uh, Kicha. Uh, Kicha. Who was it? Uh, she was the one with the baby. The baby yeah, died. Uh, Kicha Kicha... Gautami. Who is it? Say it again. Kicha Gautami. Kicha Gautami. Okay. She had a baby. One baby. Mm. The baby oh. was dead. She took it to the Buddha. She figured if he's really a Buddha, he can bring the baby back to life. So he, she went to the Buddha and asked him to bring the baby back to life. The Buddha paused. He saw her pain. He saw her suffering, saw her tears. And what did he do? He gave her a chore to do. He gave her a mustard seed. Uh, she, she, he said, no, you have to go and find me a mustard seed but it has to be a mustard seed from a house that has never had anyone die from that house. And so she went door to door in the city with this baby in her arms to tell people what was happening and that she needed this mustard seed in order to go back to the Buddha so he could help her. And she went and door to door and she could not find one house in the whole entire city where she was and she came back and told him, and then she went to the forest and she buried the baby. And what did she learn? She came back to clean herself up. And as she was washing her legs in the stream, as the water was running down, she watched the droplets of water running down from her knee to her ankle. And she saw, she saw impermanence. She saw Anicca she began to understand that everything that arises has to pass away. So here's the question. A woman asked a PhD in Buddhist studies in Illinois University, okay, at a conference in Chicago and asked this person, what, happened in this story, she said, was unforgivable. That was the cruelest thing he could have done to that person. How uncompassionate of him, how horrible of him to be a Buddha. This is someone who came out of a Buddhist studies department. I don't know what happened. But I stood there and said, I'm sorry, that's not exactly what happened here. But she, he didn't, she didn't realize this, the value of what the person had even learned. Many, many people just don't understand the impact of grasping impermanence completely. And for her, it's, it set her free, it got her into the flow of understanding. There's more to this. There's more to this. It's not about me. This is universal. This is impermanence. Everything, everyone is born, lives, dies. It's not important, you know, it's not important. You have nothing to do with how you're born, nothing. And you probably won't have much to do with how you die in the end, although you can 
the only place that you have any power at all is in between here and here. See, that's the truth of the matter. So what we do in our life is the only place we become powerful. And if we really understand the present moment, the present time, then we begin to understand how the way we decide to see something and as it's happening and everything, that's up to us, our view of things. Because it's true, it's true. And the best examples of seeing this, the, the value of the impermanence and, and then how you decide to see things is going to a town where a tornado hit and nothing's left but toothpicks. Nothing's left but just pencil sized things this side all over the ground and it's all completely gone. Buried underneath the rubble, some people found some pictures, some people found some tiny things that were left. But basically speaking, it's wiped off and the people, when you deal with the people, there'll be some people that understand whatever arises passes away and they can get back to a level of gra gravity, a, a level of balance. Then there'll be some people who will almost kill themselves of why did this happen to me? And what have I done? And what, what has, why has all this come down on me completely? But did it, did it? Or was it a natural phenomena thing that happened? And how will one person look at it and another person look at it? And there's some heavy duty situations, but I've seen some remarkable things between the person who is clear and the person who is unclear. You know, the person who is unclear folds up and has a breakdown and is really in bad way. The person who is clear about it all comes down to this point of impermanence, the suffering and understanding clearly that everything is impersonal, then how am I gonna look at this and where do we go from here? And those are the ones that go back out there and they're cleaning up everything and they're helping each other and they're working really hard. And you find anybody, anybody that's ever in a disaster, the best thing you can do in a shelter when somebody is almost hysterical is to have them help another person. You take care of her. You need to take care of her. What do you mean I'm a complete? Yes, but she needs something. You'd be amazed when you tell somebody who's really upset. There's somebody over there that is in a worse way that needs help constantly. You, you can be here by yourself and survive through this in the shelter, but that person over there is an older person with no one left to help them. Go sit with that person. You watch what happens to this person and the older person. But when you're starting to take care of somebody, all of a sudden something happens in your mind. Your stuff left the building. And now you're taking care of somebody and pretty soon your stuff, which is still in there, but it's just not on the surface. It doesn't seem so important so much anymore. And I often send people to visit, go and see Nick without arms and legs. It's the best example in the whole world for me to send somebody to go listen to Nick without arms and legs, born without arms and legs. On the bottom of his torso, he has one foot that can go like this, that can go like push and he can jump up onto a chair. Yeah. <laughs> But Nick with arms and legs, and then tell me how bad your world is and how horrible the world's been to you and everything else after you go and listen to Nick with arms and legs. And he's not there to preach to you. He is a Christian, but he's not there to preach Christianity to you. He's just talking about life and the way it really is. And he's really, really something. So I talked to one guy, uh, that lives near here about being without legs and he's not um, uh, he's not mobile, he's paralyzed. It feels like it's the end of the world. And he's living on the hope that they can do something eventually about this, but they haven't and it's been two or three years. And my question to him, whenever I visit him, I get him going. I just wish I was there long enough to keep him going. 
he's one of the most handsome men I've ever met in my, I've ever sat in front of in my life. He's just gorgeous. Why can't he sit at a desk and do a job and help people and, you know, work with people and get a job that is about traveling and eventually someone would take him and help him to travel some. He wants to travel more than anything. And this happened to him. He had an accident with his bike and he's paralyzed from the waist down. Is he supposed to end his life? No, he's not supposed to end his life. He's, this is uh, this is the uh, hurdle. This is his hurdle. The hurdle that was put in front of him, he needs to get over it. I drove out uh, about uh, two or three hours from Mumbai one time. We were driving along a road. And both going, I forget where I was, honestly, but going to where I was going. And again, when I was coming back at the same store, there was a vet. I knew he was a vet just by the way he carried himself. And this vet is um, immobile and he has a wheelchair that can just whip around with one of those light ones. He can just whip around with, he uses it as a gymnasium for his arms and the rest of his body for exercise. There's a way you can do that. He's so strong and he's gonna go everywhere. And the first time when I saw him, he was coming out of the store and he was getting in the car. On the way back, I said to, we, I can't even remember who was with me. I said, you know, hey, look, there he is again. Now he's, this guy's getting him into a car which he's had built for him, where he can run everything this way with the, the gas, the, uh, the, uh, the gas and the brakes and the shifts and everything from these, these mechanical things. He had a really good job, I guess, when, he, when this happened to him or he had enough money to have a car built. And he has uh, the guy hooking on his, uh, his uh, wheelchair onto the back of his uh, vehicle and he's gonna take off. He's not gonna let anything stop him. You see, now this other person is in a poorer family. But still, I believe that he would be one of the best people that could possibly exist for a travel agent. He could become a travel agent and do everything online. He could help people travel. And if he was dedicated to the travel industry, he'd find a lot of interesting people and everything else. Who knows what could turn up? But it's giving up, giving up on just having something put you down. I was in a chair once for a month and a half. Thank you. I didn't want to be in there anymore, but I had, I decided when it happened to me, what happened that I would learn a lot while I was in the chair. That's what I decided. And they didn't know what exactly had happened. I'd been in an accident. So I took advantage of it and had my daughter help me go to stores and find out how difficult it was for people to move around in wheelchairs in stores how inaccessible it was to hunt for clothes around, you know, these circular things that you hang clothes on. And the store wants more and more merchandise. And so they jam them all together. Well, how do you go shop if you're on a, in a wheelchair? And we did a lot of experiments with how people treat you when you go in the store. And here I was stuck in a wheelchair. <laughs> so finally, why not take advantage of it? So how, how do you look at it? You know, you can sit there and just see your whole life go away. And if you're permanently in a chair, or you can look at what you're going to do for other people about wheelchairs and mobility issues. If you're in a wheelchair and discover what are they all griping about anyway? Well, get in a wheelchair sometime in a town in America and then figure out what they're talking about. You'll find out. One time we were fighting for the curb in uh, Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, it, there was a curb that did, there was no way for people to go on wheelchairs in the main part of the city in the downtown area because the curbs were not um, fit for going up and down. They weren't like this. There was a bump at the bottom and the town council, the city council thought there was nothing to it. So I challenged them and I said, okay, which one of you, which one of you is gonna get in a wheelchair? We'll get one from the hospital put you in an electric wheelchair and let's see if you can get across the street before the light changes. <laughs> and they, put, they fixed the lips. <laughs> they had to do it according to the ADA code. They had to do it. They were fighting everybody. And then with fussing with, it's not that big of a deal. And I'm there put, somebody has to get in the chair and go out and see what the deal really is. 
Yeah, they did. They did. It was a long time ago, but that was good. It was really good to good to do that. <laughs> you know, don't listen to me. Just get in the chair and go. So I think we anybody have any more questions? Any more questions? We went all over Timbuktu just then. <laughs> There's so many examples in the world of a Nietzsche, of the, uh, the suffering and the deciding if you're going to suffer or observe and learn something. If you put yourself, you know, it's said in here, uh, Ananda, from the time he became an attendant, his whole entire life was dedicated as a learner. What that meant was he was not teaching a group of monks all the time. His job was with the Buddha. Sariputta Moggallana, um, you know, um, Anuruddha and Kimball, some of the others, they were teachers in, in the system and they were teaching people before they later go out and do things on their own. So it was an amazing organization of the monks. So we should find out from Bonte next time when you come next week, um, we will look into the Buddha and Maha Pajapati go to me, go more into more into how this all happened and what the um, the creation of the nuns, what happened exactly here. Okay. And then I think we can probably cover Dewadatta. And Dewadatta is an interesting one to, to look at um, Dewadatta because these are the people who were the, uh, some were opponents and some were supporters in the next group that we look at. But um, first, Maha Pajapati, um, we need to look at how the women got, got started. Okay? Okay. Okay. <laughs> you shared the minute. Yeah, let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired from the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.